This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 316, recorded on July 25th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, great to be together. Got nice weather out there? It's beautiful, mid-70s, sunny. Here it's 28 C, which is 82, cloudy, but the humidity is 60%. It's actually not so bad. Oh, also joining I would us, love that. <laughs> you would love that. <laughs> also joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. Uh, it's great to be here. I was just double checking our weather. It is, uh, looks like it's going to thunderstorm at any moment, and it is 85 degrees, but I'd say it's like, over 80% humidity. It's really wow. yeah, damp out there. And, yeah. and from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. We have the same temperature as St. Louis, and we have humidity of, what is it, 82%. Wow. And uh, precipitation, it's been raining all morning and all last night. So we, we're in a drought in South Carolina, if you can believe that. And fortunately, it's helping our tributaries and rivers get up back to their normal levels. So the rain is welcomed, especially by the farmers. Last night on, on our live stream, Michael was my guest. And um, we said, who has the highest temperature? And the winner was Sacramento, California, 111 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. But you know, it's a dry it's heat. For like a week, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Ugh. Very, very bad. And then the runners up included Tucson at 105. It's crazy. Uh, oh. Place in China, uh, 104. Oh, yeah. Changsha, right. Changsha. Yep. Okay. Today, we ha we, we're we not going to talk about weather all day. We are going <laughs> to talk about, although weather does impact uh, infectious diseases. Uh -huh. We talked about that a bit last night. But today, we will talk about microbiology and we will start with a snippet from Petra. And by the way, both of these papers were suggested by listeners. Oh, excellent. Good job, listeners. Good job. Very good job, listeners. More suggestions, please. Today's paper I actually found very interesting for a number of reasons and also has a fantastic graphic, which I will get to. Its title is Gut Microbiota Signatures of Vulnerability to Food Addiction in Mice and Humans. And it has a very long uh, list of authors. Uh, the first author is Samuel, Samuel Nete, um, and the has a couple of senior authors, uh, Maldonado and Martin Garcia. And the two big labs that are the major contributors to this paper are um, based at the University of Gerona, I think, in Gerona, uh, Spain, and um, Fabra University in Barcelona, Spain. And this was published in Probiotics, the Journal of Gut in this year. And it's really looking at, I think, something that's um, been really interesting in the microbiome and something that still remains to be, I think, resolved in the microbiome field generally is how much our microbiome influences our physiology and how much our behavior influences our microbiome. So, for example, there are many papers on obesity, actually starting with a very famous one from my university, from the Gordon Lab, that suggests that obese mice have changes in their microbiome and that the microbiome influences the obesity. Um, but it's, you know, unclear whether which comes first. So it's a real chicken and the egg. Does the behavior in influence the microbiome um, or does microbiome influence the behavior? Or is it really an interplay? And, and my guess is in the end, it'll be an interplay between the two. But this one is actually really interesting because it's looking at not sort of an endpoint, but a behavior, which is food addiction. And this is just 
that people who can't or mice that can't stop eating. They just continually eat. They don't have any uh, feeling of being satisfied um, and continue to eat. And this, this obviously leads to obesity, but the behavior is, is designated as separate. And they're looking to see if there are differences in the microbiome in mice that are actually evolved. First, they use mice, but they also will look at people with a sort of who fit the psychological characterization of food addiction to see if there are differences in the microbiome. And um, they identify in the end, and I'll get to this, one, uh, well, they identify a number of bacterial species that are sort of signatures. They're differentially uh, low in or high in mice with the food addiction. And there are in their human, in human people who fit the sort of psychological definition of this, they also see differences, some of which overlap with the mice, which is always interesting. It's usually at the genus level. Um, but sometimes, you know, mice and human microbiota are not identical, which is important to note. So this study starts by first defining what food addiction is. And again, it's a very complex phenomenon, um, but there are really three hallmarks of it, uh, at least used in rodent models to mimic the disorder. Because again, you're trying to mimic something in mice that happens in humans, um, which is persistent food seeking, high motivation to obtain food, and compulsive-like behavior. And they have in figure one, um, sort of the kind of tests that they use to look at these three different aspects of it. Um, and I always find these mouse tests very interesting. Because they're quantitative, Here they're, right? They observe and they quantitate the behaviors. So it's, Exactly. They observe and quantitate the behaviors. That's how you can tell if a mouse, you know, fits this category, right? Sort of the same as like sort of psychological categories for, you know, people, human behaviors. Um, but with mice, obviously, you have to set it up in a sort of very closed system. So they have three tests that they use to sort of test food addiction in mice, whether they fit the category of being food addicted in their mouse model. But also, you know, ultimately, they're going to see if they can reduce some of these behaviors by altering the microbiome. And this is in figure one, and it's in the upper left corner. And they have three tests. One is persistence of response. And this is essentially how frequently, so the mice are self-administering food, how frequently they go and get food, and how long their pellet-free periods are is the first test. And if they're longer, uh, sort of their pellet-free period is less than 10 minutes when they're not going and seeking food, that sort of puts them in a high persistence category. Their second is motivation and essentially, they're asking them to earn a single pellet. And the more motivated they are, the more they'll sort of increase that behavior to earn a pellet. And it sort of increases exponentially. So that's how they look at motivation. How much are they willing to do that? And then there's compulsivity. And this one I found really interesting because they use chocolate-flavored pellets. I did not know <laughs> mice preferred chocolate flavor, but apparently. Um, and to get the special chocolate flavored pellets, they have to walk across a floor that sends out electric shocks to their feet, <laughs> which, oh, poor mice, but okay. It's, they're doing I mean, it they by don't choice. To, they're, they're doing, doing it, by, doing it choice. by choice, right? They don't have to, but they have this compulsion yeah. to do it. So I thought that was really interesting. And I was thinking about the motivation because I have a, a well, I have two dogs and we try to get them to do tricks and they will not do certain things for low value treats, but only high value treats. I guess we can't <laughs> give them chocolate flavor, but certain treats, they'll cheese, they'll do anything for. And but, I'm wondering um, when Apple watches are going to be able to record every time we open the fridge or a cupboard. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Give you a shock. Yeah. <laughs> That's coming. That'll That's coming. <laughs> exactly. I'm That'll sure it. it's coming. <laughs> Um, in any case, they have these three criteria. So persistence, motivation, and compulsivity. Um, and they categorize them. And so they group them into different addicted and non-addicted. They sort of sort the mice out by these behaviors. Um, and then they look at differences in their microbiome. 
and they essentially, first of all, they they see clear groups, which is kind of amazing. But I mean, there is a continuum, but they definitely can get kind of distinct groups on it's a normal curve on either end of the curve, um, with most being in the middle, which is probably close to people depending on how we feel that day. And they basically just do microbiome studies on them. And um, what they find is they're looking at cecal, basically poop pellets. They're looking at microbes, you know, in the lower GI tract, and they see do see differences. Um, so this is not right. Your signals for being sated or not being hungry come from way up in your GI tract. Um, so these are sort of after you've digested your food kind of signals if they are influencing. And they actually have some. Uh, they have these addicted versus non-addicted sort of plots uh, in figure three and four, showing cecal microbiota and uh, correlations between different microbiomes, relative abundance at different levels versus addiction and not addiction. So, so from that, they kind of identify um, some bacteria that are associated with certain uh, behavioral phenotypes. Um, and they identify... Uh, these ones from a group of organisms called, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, Blaudia, um, which are actually in the no longer used to what used to be called the Firmicutes, but are now called the Bacilliota, um, these low GC gram positive bacteria, which includes one of my favorite model systems, Bacillus subtilis. These guys are closer to Clostridia. Um, so they're in this group of bacteria, very common, very common. Actually, the, this group are pretty common in your gut. And, but this particular genus is not super abundant. Um, and they can see differences in the abundance of these. And they see that Blaudia species change um, and are lower in people who are, in, sorry, mice that are food addicted. They then go and look at humans and they also see a difference there that are lower in these very specific organisms. And this actually brings me, there's a paper and they actually collaborate with a lab, a different lab, and they're on the paper. I wrote this down, but there's, and I, we can put this paper up, but there's a paper from another lab that identifies Blaudia in people who are obese and associated with type 2 diabetes. Um, so they're actually, this is probably what initiated this collaboration. And I think what's cool here is these bacteria are strict anaerobes. So they don't grow under normal conditions. They need prebiotics. And prebiotics are just essentially things that bacteria like to eat. So things that will foster the growth or promote the growth of probiotic organisms. In this case, they want to promote the growth of Plaudia. And they use two different I guess sugars, lactulose and rhamnose, which we can't digest and mice can't normally digest without the help of organisms. And they're sort of just trying to give the food that this group of organisms likes to promote the growth of them. And they find that when rhamnose in particular, when they give rhamnose, they see reductions in the motivation to walk across a <laughs> electrically charged floor uh, to get the chocolate pellets. And they also see um, a little bit of a difference in uh, the not only the kind of compulsive, but also the motivation. So they won't do quite as many tricks to get essentially to get the, the pellets that they want. Is that because they are able to digest a sugar so their brain thinks they're full, so they're not going to undergo the electric shock? <laughs> to fill their brain. Uh, they actually don't really know. They do know when they feed the rhamnos, they promote the growth of these organisms, which was actually shown with reducing type 2 diabetes. diabetes in this shifting other the population. Paper. Yeah. They're shifting the population. So it could be that these bacteria are, you know, changing some kind of signaling, or it could be that you know, these sugars and, I mean, other things might be promoted. But they can definitely change it by giving... The ramnos. And ramnos. And I don't actually know, like if you, usually if you eat sugars, you can't digest. This results in other side effects oh, you yes. might not want. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I don't know. For humans, they don't really discuss it. Um, but it's unclear. It's probably, 
very indirect because again, like when you eat and your stomach is full, your food has not made it even close to your gut by that, to your, your, your colon at that point, it's, you know, should be within like 30 minutes. So it would have to be a sort of indirect signaling by these guys. And it's probably a more stable signal than just the hormones that signal that you're full. But it is enticing that the human cohort, and they have 88 people in their human cohort, are displaying some of the same patterns. So there's exactly you know, reason to go on really and learn exciting. more. Yeah, it is really exciting um, that maybe by changing the gut. And again, this I think goes to uh, more not what we're eating or even the food itself, but it really goes to the gut brain interaction and that interface, which we really know very little about because uh, again, because it's indirect, it's probably that the Blaudia species are influencing some kind of hormonal signaling that feeds back into the sort of um, behaviors that lead to this food addiction, at least in the mouse, my mouse situation. And so the hope would be that maybe this would be a, I guess, a prebiotic way of sort of treating an eating disorder in humans. And you would probably also want to combine it with other things because, again, these are super complex. It's not just low blaudia that lead to the food addiction mm. in humans, possibly in mice. But um, it would be really interesting to kind of see, like, if you take a sort of, you know, talk therapy, uh, maybe some other medications and the Ramnos, you know, to kind of do a more controlled study in humans as much as you can do that would be really exciting. But again, I think it's really interesting and it, it's very striking that they found these bacteria that have been found. Yeah, enticing correlations. Exactly. Enticing correlations. I think it is exciting that they found them in this food addiction because they also found it in the obese type 2 diabetes situation. The real question I have there is like, maybe they're really looking at very, I'm sure those Venn diagrams are pretty overlapping, but um, it was really interesting. And it, I mean, it's actually really beautiful. And I really like the idea of showing, you know, we, my family really enjoys these prebiotic sodas we can get at Costco. Um, <laughs> so I'm now wondering, like, I mean, only for the past like year, but I'm wondering like the idea that prebiotics can really influence behavior is, is something that I think hasn't been explored. It's always prebiotics will help your gut, but like how? So here- I We think also have to think about nice. time because while it takes about six to eight hours for food to go from your mouth through your small intestine to from the mouth to the exit in the large intestine, that's about 36 hours. And so the blothia is down in the large intestine. So, you know, you're effectively doing a day and a half in, in terms of, so you have to ask what your family is doing a day and a half after they consume the the Costco prebiotic soda. <laughs> no, no, exactly. But I also wonder though, because I mean, those bacteria probably, they, I'm guessing, grow quite slowly in anaerobic conditions. Yeah. So it's probably more of whether you have a stable population yeah. of them. So you probably have to continually, and again, I don't know if the prebiotic sodas that we drink, um, just mostly because they're tasty and pretty cans, um, if they are impacting us long term. But if it is that you want these sort of to be a, you probably want them to be a stable population. So again, it's not like I can eat something and that will stop me from being hungry the next day. It's more mm. like if I continually essentially have these sugars and you might be able to get them probably from, you know, vegetables and fruits and other things as well, maybe that will help stabilize my gut and, and help with at least some behaviors I don't like. Uh, the idea of correcting issues with uh, microbiomes is not new, but we did a paper on twin recently where they used lactobacillus reuteri to try and improve behavior in kids with uh, autism. autism spectrum disorder. And um, it, it improved their social behavior. Actually, the clinical trial where they fed, they had controls, children who had uh, ASD and improved their social behavior, but not the severity. So it's, it's more than just one bacterium. Oh, and I'm sure it's not even only bacteria. Yeah, that's, the that's other right. Thing. Other things too, right? As much as I would like bacteria to be controlling everything, other behaviors like schizophrenia um, have been associated with changes in the microbiome, and also they mention in their discussion that um, patients with alcoholism and gut dysbiosis um, have an altered uh, abundance of protobacteria, um, much like they've showed here. So it's a small right. but growing literature. 
And, and Dan, and what's really interesting to me is how much is like, it's sort of like you sort of start this behavior, you reduce sort of change your microbiome, and then the change microbiome reinforces the behavior. And essentially, you end up sort of reinforcing both the behavior and the dysbiosis. Yeah. And it sort situations. of makes sense that the microbes would have evolved a way to um, encourage their host to a certain behavior that helps the <laughs> bugs. <laughs> helps the mm-hmm. population Although I would expand. think that in this case, it's the non-Blautia yes. bacteria that are that are doing it, right? Because it's their advantage to have the chocolate-flavored mouse pellets, I guess. <laughs> yes. It reminded me of the Broadway musical, uh, The Little Shop of Horrors, where the plant is <laughs> screaming, feed me, feed me. <laughs> so the nice thing about this is that it they did it in mice, but then it's there's also a correlation yeah. in humans, which is nice, right? Oh, yeah, yeah because many mice, many microbiome studies, and we don't talk about this that much, but a lot of microbiome studies are taking uh, mice, notobiotic sort of sterile mice, mice yeah. from a, like braised in a bubble, basically, and putting human bacteria in them. And, and those human bacteria from a human gut are not at all adapted to growing in mice. mice. I mean, they will, but that's not the normal mouse flora is not human E. coli, it's a related, a different species or different subspecies. So, And Petra, you did a lovely job of summarizing this in a fairly, you know, straightforward manner, but this paper is loaded with data. The number of data points is yeah. just amazing and all different plots, the volcano plots, the PCA analysis, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> No, the PCA is really nice, the principal component analysis. The yep. principal component analysis looks at kind of what what's the same and what's different. Mm-hmm. And they're usually plotting one group of things versus the other. And often they just people will just show you PCA one versus PCA two without telling you what's in components one and components two. And here they actually tell you a little bit about those components. It is loaded with data. I was trying to stick to the snippet spirit. Yeah, yes. no, you did great. So. And it's an open access paper for those of you interested, and the links in the show notes. And when you download the paper, you can download all the supplemental data, and then it tomes out at 50-plus pages. <laughs> chock mm, a full of data, as Michelle said. In the discussion, they talk about a cocaine addiction mouse model where they see similar changes in Blaudia. Interesting, because and then it's not what's being fed. It's what's the being addiction. Hailed. So. Addic- addiction behavior, which could be really broad, right? Because there are lots of addictions, not just stuff you eat or take as drugs. Right. I'm addicted to viruses. Seen, Do we exactly. have to give me microbiome <laughs> to fix it? All right, no, Vincent. We go, keep you. We're going to send you <laughs> to the restroom and you're going to produce a sample. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Petra. That's cool. And thank you, listener. I, I will have to look up who. Who, who sent this in, and um, thank you next time. Really appreciate it. And so the next paper, which I will do, it was also sent in by a listener. And this is a, a research article in Science, a phage tail-like bacteriocin suppresses competitors in metapopulations of pathogenic bacteria. And this is, uh, the first author here is Talia Backman, and one of the two corresponding authors is Talia Karasov. Uh, and there's another corresponding author, Herman Burbano. And Talia Karasov, she's at the uh, University of Utah. She was on Twivo uh, in, um, I don't know, Twivo 45, which we're now on 100. So it's over, it's, it's a long time ago. That was in 2019 at an ASM meeting. So Nels and myself and Talia uh, we talked to her, and, and this was the subject. She talked about, she reveals that in contrast to agriculture, wild plants are colonized by multiple lineages of pathogenic bacteria. So she had already made that observation as a postdoc, which I think she did in Germany, and she was on her way to take this faculty position at Utah. And now this paper is exploring the mechanistic basis for that. This um, is a Big collaboration, not only University of Utah, University College London, the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, the University of Georgia, even New York University here gets in the act, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So this is all about plants. Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a plant often worked on in the laboratory, it's genetically manipulable, grows quickly. 
it's also outside. It's, it grows in the wild, just like C. elegans and fruit flies are all out there. It's relatively <laughs> the small. grows out in the wild. It's small, so it's not it's like you have small, lots of yeah. trees that you have to study each one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It grows very well. It's a very favorite model of plant biologists. So this is all about understanding um, bacteria that infect plants and, you know, agriculture that's important. Um, but uh, she has chosen to look in wild plants because the story is, is very different. So w when, when pathogens colonize the plant, the, there's a plant immune system, right, that deals with it to some extent. But there are also other microbes that compete. Um, and in agricultural crops, these are genetically homogeneous. They're monocultures, right? They're produced from se seeds that are manufactured mostly by Monsanto. But and sold, <laughs> yes, and um, they are susceptible to disease because of that. It's like people who don't have d diverse MHC uh, are more susceptible to disease. Uh, and so the same diseases that attack agricultural plants are rare in wild populations. And these wild populations, as I told you uh, before, are colonized by diverse pathogens at low levels, and none of them take over. No single pathogen takes over. Uh, they seem to coexist peacefully, some kind of detente. And so how that works is a good question. And that's, that's one of the, um, that's the question that they're asking uh, in this paper. And they start by thinking, well, okay, what kind of defense mechanisms do bacteria have uh, against each other? And, and some of them are repurposed from phages, right? Phages infect bacteria and lyse them and bacteria have repurposed some of the phage genes and gene products to <laughs> counter other bacteria, right? Making the best of a bad situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take like type six secretion systems are repurposed by bacteria and also phage tail like bacteria sins or talosins. So these are remnants of the phage injection system that the bacteria have are using to target competing uh, bacteria and they have specificity. They bind to specific, these talosins bind to specific receptors, so they can be specific for a certain group of bacteria. These phage remnants are thought to be drivers of microbiome composition, both in host and, and non-host environments. But whether that happens in the wild, people don't know. And that's one of the things that Talia does is to study. She does field work. She will also do lab experiments, as you see here, but she goes out in the field and collects specimens and asks what's going on with them. And so Arabidopsis is the, is the subject here. And it is colonized with a diverse population of Pseudomonas bacterial pathogens. And there are multiple Pseudomonas viridiflava populations. And even within a single plant, you have multiple strains with no dominant strain. And she's always been interested in why is that? I remember back in the, our, our Twivo episode, she said, why is it that these strains can coexist? Why doesn't one become uh, dominant? And so um, they, they hypothesize that hey, maybe it's the phage components uh, that can suppress <laughs> other pseudomonas strains. So that's what they're looking at in this paper. So the, in particular, well, they, they have an open mind. They're gonna, they start by collecting different plant isolates and uh more than a hundred different plant isolates more than a hundred mm -hmm. yes they're very ambitious and they have they characterize the uh, viral elements in 1524 pseudomonas genomes all collected from arabidopsis in southwestern germany so again that's where she was a postdoc she collected she went out and collected all these things i remember her talking about it she said on a nice day it's nice to go outside and collect plants <laughs> And so they did genome sequencing, and um, over 85% of these genomes are classified as a specific clade of P. Viri, viridiflava pseudomonas. It's called ATUE5, which is an opportunistic pathogen that colonizes Arabidopsis throughout Europe and the U.S. They found viral sequences in 99.3% of these bacterial genomes an average of two viral sequences per genome. I bet you liked that <laughs> result, didn't you, Vincent? I love it. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Well, of course, I'm biased here because the phage is the second word in the title. So. Yeah. Yes. 
And then once you have all these sequences, you can start to make associations between certain clades of Pseudomonas and viral sequence clusters. And um, they found that one viral sequence cluster, remember, they found viral sequences in over 99% of the genomes, and they could divide them into clusters. One cluster, VC2, was found in all the pathogenic strains of uh, Arabid ATUE5 Arabidopsis, but less frequent, 29% in non pathogenic isolates outside of the ATUE5 clade. And these sequences, these VC2 sequences, are 24 genes that are co-linearly integrated in all genomes at the same location, specifically between the bacterial genes TRIP-E and TRIP-G. So they're all integrated at the same position. Plus, what do they encode? Typical prophage, base plates, tail spikes, tubes, sheath, tail fibers, assembly chaperones, transcriptional regulation proteins. That's what's encoded in these uh, viral sequences. And you cannot forget to mention your good friend, Lex A. (laughs) Lex A. (laughs) Yes, Lex A. Yeah, which keeps them off. Right. Keeps them turned off. Very important. But missing are things needed for replication of phage DNA and, and encapsulation. Capsid is gone. Terminase, integrase, recombinase proteins. So the maybe these they don't encode functional phages, just parts of it. And um, they, but they say it did look like previously described phage tail-like bacteriocins, tailocins, which are that, that's why they call them tailocins because they're derived from uh, the tails. Um, basically, repurposed. These have previously previously been described uh, to to kill bacteria by targeting, using these talisins to target the bacteria. So they went, said, okay, first do these pseudomonas strains make talisins? So they, they induce the uh, prophage, the integrated phage DNA with mitomycin C. My gosh, I remember that from graduate school. Uh-huh. <laughs> Even I, a non, non-bacteria person, I remember that. Because I did a rotation in a phage lab and we induced with mitomycin C. You have lysogens you want to turn on? Boom. <laughs> Boom. Damage the DNA. UV um, works too. And then they take the lysates and do transmission electron microscopy. And indeed, they can see talosins, right? It looks like tail structures, typical of phages. There are two forms. There's a uncontracted and a contracted form uh, that they see. They're beautiful. Um, and nothing else. They're really cool. Very nice structures. To give folks an idea of what they actually look like, if you can imagine a screw and it looks like a screw, it has a head and it looks like there are threads on it. And you can almost imagine how the (laughs) talison would screw itself in to the bacterium to effectively violate it and cause it to explode. So basically that's the mechanism, right? It makes a hole. Yeah. And and the contents come out. Yep. Uh, Uncouple the membrane. Or or is it more... Or is it more sophisticated? There are no, there are they... variations on the themes. Colicins can principally, or bactericins, I should say, they're three principal mechanisms. But the biggest is, of course, you uncouple the membrane potential, and then they're dead. Mm. You can also poke a hole in the membrane, and then the contents leak out. But the, they really do okay. look like a screw on that figure two panel C. That EM looks like a screw head to me. Yeah, this bottom one in particular. Yeah. It's very nice, yeah. I'll add that the first author, Talia Backman, um, said that when she was beginning this study and they finally got their sequence back from all these genomes, she was really disappointed that there wasn't a full prophage there because she she was thinking she was going to be studying this phage. But then her um, her mentor, who, who they refer to as Big Talia... <laughs> <laughs> the student is named Tilly, and so is uh, the mentor, um, brought her a paper describing Taylorsons, which was news to, to little Talia. <laughs> and so once she read that, and then, of course, once they saw this EM, she was really excited, and that launched uh, this PhD project. And then they do mass spec, and they actually confirm that these are Taylorsons. They look at the protein sequence and... Um, it's 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 clearly a talisman and nothing else. They don't see anything else. So uh, it is a this this is a, the ATUE 
five strain viral. This sequence is an active and inducible, and it's a it's an R type talus in a very specific type. Okay, now um, they they look more at the sequences of uh, of the, the the viral sequences, the VC two and and the genomes, and they find this is conserved across these strains that they've isolated. The 1,524 Pseudomonas geno- uh, isolates, they've, they've sequenced their genomes. All 27 talisin genes were found in over 90% of these genomes. Uh, so wow. it's it's in the core, and it, they, it sounds like it's essential, right? Yeah. Um, and the phylogenetic analysis also tells you that uh, there was a single integration in an ancestor because they're all integrated at the same place, right? So there must have been a single integration in the ancestor that was really good for its fitness, so it was maintained. Didn't have to change. Uh, they also find that the the diversity in the VC2 genes go along with diver- diversity in the core genes of the Pseudomonas host. So the amount of change that they see in the viral genes parallels that in the host, suggesting, again, that they have co-evolved uh, together. Now, these... Uh, these genes, there are two talus in genes that are their presence. And one is called the hypothetical tail fiber, and the other is called HTF, and the other is called the tail fiber assembly. And that's going to come in later uh, as we talk. So remember those terms, HTF and TFA. They're just two genes that are part of this talus. In. And so further analysis of all these sequences and, and dividing them, the, the sequences, the haplotypes and so forth, uh, indicate that um, these different ATUE5 strains, these pseudomonas strains, encode one of a few divergent variants. Um, so there are a few variants among all these isolates, and maybe they have different killing activity. They don't know. That's something they want to look at. So they said, okay, these talisins may be used to keep your competitor in check, right? You make a talisin and it limits your competitor. Maybe that's why no single pseudomonas ever um, dominates. You make a, a, a talisin and you keep your competitor down, but your competitor makes a talisin and keeps you down, so you're both kept at a low, at a low <laughs> level. That's a simple version. <laughs> they talk. Better everybody suffer. <laughs> yep. Right. I'm sure there's a Shakespearean quote that would reflect that, but I don't know what it is. Well, you almost have to ask the question, how dependent is this process of expressing the talus and what's the leak rate or what's the off rate of Lex A? Because Lex A is on and mm-hmm. off and, you know, that's effectively, it, it's nothing more than the Lex A on and off switch and there's always some dynamic equilibrium, how much is on and how much is off. And that's what probably keeps the community heterogeneous, is that there's always talisins mm-hmm. being released to trim out the bad actors so no one ever becomes dominant on the leak. Do you think it's random or or do you think there's signals? I don't know if there's signals or not, but from what I know about promoter dynamics, it's, it's stochastic. It, you know, whether or not the RNA polymerase is able to find Lexa and do its thing and, and whether or not you get weak through and all those other things that go with. Is that something that's interesting? And they didn't look at here, but yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting to know what fraction of the population too, because sometimes these things are in a very small fraction of the population because it's not great actually for the bacteria probably to turn these things on all the time. Because you're dead. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Because they're dead and you don't want to die. You just want to kill the other one. That's right. 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 You don't want to kill yourself either. So that's another thing that we'll see. Yeah, exactly. So it's probably a smaller. But it's very altruistic. For the good of the community, (laughs) I'll die. (laughs) That's what they're thinking yeah. when they do this. Is I'm doing this good? for you. Would that be called common good? <laughs> yeah. No, it's not a common mm, no, good per no. se. Common no? good would be like if one bacteria makes a, a metabolite another bacteria needs. Like oh, something that helps that yeah. kills, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't think th- this is okay. a, yeah. This is like a munitions factory. <laughs> <laughs> so they, okay, so they said this talisin is, is used for competition. So they want to do an experiment and say, it, does it is it work against other pathogenic pseudomonas that make talisins? Does it work against commensals that don't make talisins? And what about other bacterial strains in the phylosphere? So the phylosphere, all the 
organisms associated with a plant. They're not just pseudomonas. They're all kinds, right? Mm -hmm. Do these work uh, against them. So they do an experiment. They make these talisans. They partially purify them. And then they add them to strains, 55 ATUE5 strains. That's the one they've been working on so far. 28 other ATUE strain, not five, but others. And over 50 other strains isolated from the phylosphere. And they don't know what they are. Taxonomy unknown. <laughs> so the ATUE5 strains are resistant to their own talisin, right? So they add it to the cultures and see if they grow or not, right? The ATUE5s are resistant. The non-ATUE5 pseudomonas are sensitive in only 6% of the treatments. But 40% of the ATUE5 treatments with ATUE5 derived talisins are sensitive. Not the one that makes it, but other ATUA, ATUE5 strains. Uh, and then these 50 colonies, <laughs> taxonomy unknown, none of them are sensitive to talisin treatment. And um, Well, that sort that, of so makes Daniel's, sense. That sort of makes sense. They don't have the right yes. receptor for the totally, talisin yeah. to effectively interact with. And that what might the receptor be? Hmm. <laughs> yes. that's something we're going to look at. yeah that's something we're going to look at then they then of course they this is a very nice experiment so are we sure it's the talisin so they make it tfa deficient mutants one of the genes that comprises the, the whose product comprises the talisin and they collect talisins from the mutant and there's no killing activity so you it, it is the talisin itself that is doing the killing um there are Remember, the TFA and the HTF genes encode the proteins that make up the talisin. They want to know if there are any haplotypes associated with killing activity. They didn't find any strict correlation, but they found that um, tail and HTF hap haplotypes, different haplotypes of each, ha all display broad killing against other ATUE5 strain. And there was a, they don't know why, but one factor that jumped to their attention was that the length of the HTF and the tail and its killing spectrum varied together. So the tail fibers may be, so they said, maybe this means the tail fibers are important in binding the target cells and that um, maybe that length can vary and, and control that. So the longer ones were more promiscuous. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What about in plants? This is all in, in cultures in the laboratory, right? So they do competition uh, assays in plants. So they would put a specific bacteria in a plant and a talisin, and they ask whether the talisin can kill uh, the bacteria. And in fact, um, they, they find yes. In the plant, it works too. The talisin kills competitors. And so even though it's kind of an artificial situation where they're inoculating them, it shows that it works in the plant. Important control. Now, they have also found differences in susceptibility of different strains to talisins, and they want to know, well, maybe there's a receptor, as Michael mentioned, and, and what might it be? So they do a transposon mutagenesis screen. So they, they have taken one of their strains and, and littered its genome with insertions, and they look for uh, bacteria that are resistant to one specific talisin, P25.812. And they, they identify insertions in 70 genes associated with resistance to the talisin. Six of these genes are within a biosynthetic gene cluster for O antigen, which is, has, is known to be involved in resistance to phage and talisin phage <laughs> tail fibers. So it's all very consistent, right? And O antigen is and a component of LPS, which is very abundant in the envelope. Right. right. Okay. right. It decorates LPS as this charged, yep. basically carbohydrate sugar molecule on the outside of gram negative bacteria. And O antigen on not, is on not all bacteria, actually, but mm -hmm. it is a receptor for mm -hmm. phage that's actually perfect. So the they look, they do some uh, analysis of, of the O antigen. They find that. Um, they compare resistant and susceptible strains. Uh, the resistant strains lack a high, a high molecular weight polysaccharide chain that's present in the susceptible change, and they identify that as uh, being rich in ramnose. So they think it's the back. genes uh, that it's are in back <laughs> is back. <laughs> it's back. The genes involved in the biosynthesis of uh, O antigen, in including. Uh, 
the ramnos here is um, possibly a receptor. So the O antigen is the receptor, and the and and ramnos is is possibly important. And they've knocked out these ramnos involved genes, and that d- uh, decreases the attachment of the talisman. Exactly. I mean, you can't make O antigen without making sugar. So yeah. perfect, and it's back. I'm so happy. <laughs> Ramnos is the is the hero of this. Today's Ramnos episode. Day. Yeah. It's Ramnos Day, a sugar you never thought about. That's right. So um, then, then they say, okay, since since strains are resistant to their own talisman, it must be that the receptor and the talisman co-evolves, right? Because you don't want the receptor to change, so that could now bind your own talisman, right? Because that would be lethal. So you. Changes in the receptor and the talisman are going to happen at the same time. So they actually look at that, and it's true that the two genes evolve. Okay. All right. What about the, the time scale of this stuff? When did this happen? <laughs> so they have a two centuries old collection of um, Arabidopsis, right? That, which have been in, in various herbarium collections, and they use ancient DNA techniques to retrieve <laughs> DNA from this uh, this collection. And, you know, people have used these techniques that look at Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA, right? Yesterday on Twivo, we did a paper where they used it to sequence a piece of skin from a 40,000-year-old woolly mammoth that had been desiccated in Siberia. Wow. And so they're very special techniques that you need to sequence ancient DNA because it's fragmented and it's damaged and all of this stuff. But they, the techniques are there and you can use them. So they get genomes of these uh, old old specimens and they can make phylogenetic trees and um, look for single nucleotide polymorphism. They say basically they get three of these historical samples or within the, di- the present day diversity of the ATUE5 strains. So they say this. Taylison has been there for 177 years, which is the oldest of their specimens. <laughs> so it started a long time, maybe even before that, of course. But um, you can see uh, the Taylison insertion in the same place. All the genes are there. And in each of these historical variants, there's a slightly different Taylison, right? And those are all found in present day populations. So as far back as you can look, uh, you can say the same haplotypes have been circulating in this in these pseudomonas for the past 177 years. And then finally, they ask, okay, well, our specimens are all from Germany. Maybe it's funny in Germany and, and <laughs> doesn't happen anywhere else, right? <laughs> so they compare uh, genomes of uh, all their all of their German collections, and then at broader locations using genomes from the NCBI collection. So five from the U.S., three from Europe, and two from New Zealand. And they find the talisans in all of them, basically. And the lengths are conserved, and they're in the same place. So not only with time, but geographically, they're present all over. So this must be a really powerful fitness mechanism. I, right I think this geographic distribution says it's a lot longer than a 200 a years. years. Oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's much, just the oldest samples we have, right? Right, right, exactly. right. They left no yep. leaf unturned in this study. They did oh, everything they brought. Oh, Michelle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ancient, <laughs> ancient collections of bacteria. They used phylogenetics. They used mass spec. Um, they used whole uh, transposon mutagenesis to identify it. They went back and got these historical strains. Um, it's just amazing uh, that the every leaf that they unturned, <laughs> they overturned to, to tell this beautiful story. <laughs> yeah, it's really well done. It's beautiful. Good job, everybody it's, there. It, and it looks like Talia's lab is up and going. That's great. Yes, and she was lucky to recruit Talia Backman, who's now a fourth-year doctoral <laughs> student in the lab um, and a member of the Microbial Pathogenesis Training Program. So she's funded by a T32 fellowship from the NIH. She always loved science and loved nature as a kid. Um, so in college, she thought she wanted to be a forensic scientist. And she actually had a three-month internship at Utah State Crime Lab. And that also motivated her to, to major in chemistry um, at Utah Valley University. She also um, spent uh, five months teaching English in China on a um, as a 
internship and then did a six-month service mission in, in New York City. But she also did an elective um, taking an ev- evolutionary biology course, and she fell in love. She switched majors, then did research in three different research uh, in three different uh, laboratories as an undergrad, and then um, was convinced that this was the path for her. So she um, chose to, to pursue a PhD. She says she loves research and the wonder it brings about the world around us. It constantly keeps her feeling existential. <laughs> uh, she says that she couldn't have done this work without all the great mentors and collaborators. And, you know, they, they brought, as I mentioned, a lot of very um, sophisticated techniques to this, uh, these questions. And specifically, she wants to thank um, Sergio Latora and um, Dr. Barbano at the University College of London and also um, her um, advisor, Talia Karasov at Utah for all their guidance and ideas and the discussions that they had. She does have advice for junior colleagues. She says the most important part of success in her research has been to study aspects of biology that she's fascinated by. And also, more importantly even, find a PI who has a similar style. She said she she recognizes that she likes to jump in experiments, quickly analyze data, plan the next experiments. So she knew that um, she needed a, a PI that um, would embrace that kind of uh, <laughs> go get them attitude. And if instead they were kind of a perfectionist, that might kind of kill her excitement. So it's a great match between the two Talias. She's also <laughs> delighted to share that during the same year, um, they published this beautiful paper. She also started her family, had her first baby. And that is uh, was an important lesson because she'd been told as an undergraduate student that having children, you know, is going to get in the way of your career. But she said her experience has been the opposite. She feels even more motivated as a scientist um, now that she's also a mom. So congratulations, Talia. This is a beautiful study. And um, may you have as many terrific collaborators um, <laughs> helping you raise your kid as you did with this beautiful paper. <laughs> so to, to summarize here, we have a, a plant that has many different pseudomonas strains in it. And apparently one mechanism that prevents any single pseudomonas from dominating is the production of a talisin that can kill some of the competitors. But I'm sure there are other mechanisms as well, right? This is just one that they identify. And I just wonder if you could do an experiment. If you could, I'm sure you could drive a, a Arabidopsis with no bacteria in it. And then maybe you could put two different strains in without where you've knocked out the talisans and see what happens and see if one predominates because it's got some other advantage or something. I think that's where they're going to eventually go to figure out some of these mechanisms. But they point out in the discussion that talisans have been suggested that it can be used like phage therapy to treat right. bacterial infections, right? It's where it's, again, it's going to be a little structure, right, from the phage, so multiple proteins, but not the entire phage. So, and I think there have been experiments done in, in animals and plants to mm-hmm. show that the proof of concept, yeah. right? So the authors say, we need to find more talisins, right? And we could take metagenomics and just mine them for and cocktails. You know, we want to put several together or many together. You don't want to put just one in because you'll get resistance probably. So um, maybe we can make cocktails of talisins and uh, treat people with those someday. Well, especially plants. it's important. Treat plants with them. Well, treat not plants. necessarily yeah. plants. You could treat people. You could yeah, people too. You could go you know, after exactly pseudomonas right. infections that infect people. You could similarly ask the question: Are there talisins for acinetobacter, which is extremely drug resistant in people causes devastating pneumonias. And I guess the question is, how would you deliver these guys? uh, You would actually probably capsule. uh, (laughs) You would either uh, in the case of a pneumonia, you would nebulize them because they're small Mm -hmm. enough. They're, they're nano part, they're nano particles. Truly you could nebulize it and deliver the particle because I doubt the talisin would be disrupted by the nebulization and you could deliver it in situ to the infection. Uh, consider a pseudomonas infection and cystic fibrosis kits. You could effectively clear the biofilm and the talisin is small enough that it would probably seep through the cracks and the alginate uh, snot. That's a hallmark of pseudomonas aeruginosa infections in CF patients. So there's a paper in the literature cited 
uh, from 2015, a modified R-type bacteria sin, specifically targeting C. diff, prevents colonization of mice without affecting the gut microbiota diversity. So, Right, and they had data that showed get, that, right? They had some 50 unknown mm-hmm. bacteria, and they were completely resistant to the talisin. So that's right. it would be a that's fairly right. specific antibiotic. So I guess if you wanted to target the gut, Michael, you would use a, a, a enteric coated capsule. Yeah, right? get it, get it delivered. Come apart. Anyway, cool. Two cool papers today. Yeah, thanks to our Microbiology reader. Microbiology is amazing. You know. Yep. If, thank you. you know, we all know virology is amazing, but it turns out microbiology is too, <laughs> not and too it's shabby. Cool to study them together because that's what's happening out in nature. <laughs> it is. They're interacting. Isn't virology microbiology? You know, we do artificial we do artificial segregations because we can't think of too many things at once. But um, all right, that is TWIM three sixteen. You can find show notes at microbe.tv slash twim. If you enjoy these discussions of various papers which happen in all of our podcasts, not just TWIM, uh, all of the microbe TV podcasts, we'd love your support, your financial support, because microbe TV is a 5013C nonprofit entity, and your deductions, uh, your donations would be federal U.S. tax deductible, and your donations help us to continue uh, this work and support this recording studio, the incubator here in New York City. And if you want to send questions, comments, suggestions for papers, twim, a T-W-I-M at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you. Michael Schmidt, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Petra Levin, Washington University, St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.